before we start, do you guys have like any questions on uh, the worksheet two? So, uh, if you see uh, in the worksheet, the uh, first two questions, question number one and question number two, were just uh, the midterm questions from the summer semester. So, this is the level of questions that you may expect on the exam. Okay. So, just and. Uh, you wouldn't be having access to your textbooks, it would be like a, the closed uh, book and closed notes exam. So, just to let you know like the level of questions in the exam, this would be a very good uh, thing to, as a, it would be like a very good measure. And uh, <coughs> again, I sent an update about uh, those, uh, the logistics that we had, like the 8 out of the 10 sub projects, and uh, if you're leaving like 2, I hopefully they think like most of you won't, okay? But if you're doing, like just make sure that you, uh, you can only like skip projects from either one from part A, which is the Linux part, and one from part B, which is the x basic part. And uh, with respect to the exam, it was just like uh, once before the exam, you should, you should just let us know like uh, either you want the exam to be for 20 percentage or 25 percentage of the total grade, and that cannot be changed after taking the exam. Okay, so it's like you taking the risk, uh, saying like, okay, I can do well on the exams. So it's like just some uh, risk that you may you are taking. If you are not taking okay. Any other questions in general about the course or anything? So, in last class, uh, we started with CPU scheduling. And 
Yeah, so we just discussed that in the last class. And in today's class, we are going to discuss uh, about policies. Okay? So we are going to discuss CPU policies. So here the question is, uh, more usually whenever we have like both mechanisms and policies, mechanisms are the hardest parts, okay, and policies are the easiest or the easier things. So in today's class, we'll, in, at least in the first part of the class, we will like, really understand like how easy these things are going to be. So <coughs> again, uh, let's start discussing these policies. So these are the scheduling policies. How does the operating system uh, decide which process it needs to schedule next? The operating system needs to make a decision based on some like logic or some policy to decide what is the process that is to be scheduled next. And in the scheduling policies, we have like two types. Same time. 
So from the perspective of the scheduler, the scheduler wants to like schedule some job, or it is uh, like all the jobs just arrive at time t equals zero. Okay, the scheduler has all the jobs with it, and it can make a decision based on all the three jobs. Let's assume for simplicity, in our system we only have three jobs. Okay, like job A, B, and C. Scheduler, uh, yeah, we assume that all the jobs arrive at the same time, and then that assumption this says once started, each job runs to completion. So here we just mean we can't preempt. Here the word pre by the word preempt we just mean that we can't stop a job in the middle. If the scheduler schedules job A, it can't even do a context switch to job B until job A is done. Again, since we already saw the mechanisms, we really know that these assumptions are unrealistic. But these would really help us to build the scheduling policies. Okay? And then the fourth assumption is all jobs only use the CPU. So all the jobs that we are considering, three jobs A, B, and C, are just CPU-bound jobs. They don't uh, do any I/O. The last assumption, which is the, like um, which is worst, the runtime of each job is known. Okay? We assume that we really know when a job enters the system, we really know this is the maximum time that this job needs to run. The three jobs that we are considering, let's say A, B, and C. We, from the as like from the perspective of the scheduler or from the perspective of the operating system, we really know that okay, job A just needs to run for 10 seconds, job B again for 10 more seconds, and job C for 10 seconds. Something like that. We really know the runtime of each job. Okay. With these assumptions, the first scheduling policy that we are going to see is this: first come, first serve. This is the simplest scheduling policy that we have. And <coughs> here we are going to assume like an axis like this. Let's say this is the time axis, the time proceeds like this. And let's assume whatever we have here is what is the job that is being scheduled in the CPU. Okay. Again, you can use the terms job or process interchangeably. The reason we are using jobs here is like in the literature, whenever people are discussing about scheduling algorithms. They use jobs, and if you go and read any research papers related to CPU scheduling, the term jobs and workloads will be what you may see. And so, in the CPU, we are going to schedule something, but before that, we are going to like see what are the different jobs that we have. Okay, so this is the job. Let's assume we have three jobs A, B, and C, and I'm going to like write some things like T A. T A just stands for time of arrival. So arrival time of each job, okay? What time it arrives in the system? And one more parameter is time for let's assume uh, completion. You may name it in any way, but usually in the CPU uh, scheduling literature, it's called the CPU burst time. It's usually called the CPU burst time, or how much? Time in the CPU does this job need to complete? Okay, that's all this means. A time for completion. And <clears throat> so let's assume since based on based on our first assumption or second assumption, all jobs arrive at the same time. Or let's assume all the three jobs arrive at time zero, and the time for completion for each job again just 10 seconds, because each job runs for the same amount of time. Okay, with this character, with this uh, three jobs. If we have a scheduler like first come first serve, again it can choose out of from A, B, and C, it can choose any one of these things. So let's assume it chooses A and it runs from 0 to it starts at 0 and it runs till like 10 seconds and then it immediately chooses B, runs till 20 seconds and it immediately chooses C and runs till 30 seconds. This keeps on going. Okay, that is like a no problem here. All three jobs were scheduled okay, properly. And other name for first come first serve is first in first out. Now the problem here arises when we just like start uh, removing some assumptions. Okay, let's start uh, relaxing the first assumption. Each job runs for the same amount of time. If we 
you just remove this particular assumption, now what is going to happen? Let's assume instead of 10 here, okay, job. Okay, maybe one second, but just before moving on, okay, before moving on, I would like to like uh, introduce a metric, a scheduling metric. Whenever we have a scheduling uh, policy, we would like to evaluate that particular policy using some metrics. And the first metric that we are going to uh, use to evaluate is called turnaround time. It's called the turnaround time. So T. I'm just having this T A thing turn around. Okay, time for turn turn around. And this is nothing but the time of completion, time when the particular job was completed, subtracted by the time of uh, arrival. This is called the turnaround time. Yeah. So should it be the time completed, not the decompletion which we have up there already? Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, this is like confusing. So maybe. Uh, Change this to T. Required. Yeah. Oh, this is different from what we are trying to write here. Yes. So here it just means so like a what time? Yeah. Right? yeah. <coughs> runtime. Yeah, maybe we just have it as the runtime. Okay, we just have it as a runtime. This is like the run time. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. Yeah. This is the time completion in the sense like here A got completed at time 10, B got completed at time 20, and C got completed at time 30. Okay. And so if you're going to calculate the turnaround time, usually we just calculate the average turnaround time. So the average turnaround time, time for turnaround for the three jobs that we have is for the first job, it's just going to be it got completed at 10. And it started at zero, it arrived at zero. For the second job, similarly 20, it got completed at 20, started at zero. For the third job, it's just, it got completed at 30, and it also started at zero. Since we have three jobs, we just take the average, and so it just comes to 20. <coughs> so 20 seconds, so we may assume any unit, but for some reason, let's just assume it to be seconds. 20 seconds is the uh, average turnaround time for these three jobs with when they are run with the first come first serve or the first in first out scheduling policy. Okay. Now, as of now, let's assume this is the only metric that we have, but we will be introducing some other metrics later in a few minutes. So now, when we just relax the first assumption, <coughs> so this time just basically means this twenty just means that. If all these three uh, jobs are given to the system, on an average, it takes like 20 seconds for the three things to complete. Okay, and so here, uh, when we just told that okay, we are going to change this. Okay, let's assume now what happens. We just follow the same. All things arrive at zero, and but the runtime of job A is like. Uh, 100 and the runtime of other two jobs are 10 to 10. If this is the case, we can easily see that very similar to real world uh, scenarios. Like, this is the time again. So, job A is just going to take like 100 time for running, and then it is going to be job B and then the job C. It's just taking like 10 seconds each. So, this is going to be the scenario, and here you can easily see. This is the scenario, then the turnaround time, the average turnaround time is going to be 100 plus, for this it's just like 110 minus 0, so 110 plus for the third job it's 120 minus 0, 120 by 3. So it's like 330 by 3. You can see like the average turnaround time just increased to 110 when we used the first come first serve. Uh, scheduling policy in this case because the first job was like so large. How can we uh, decrease it? How can we decrease the average turnaround time? Any ideas? Pop it again. 
form the threat and just form the largest job to the end. And so, if <coughs> we want to do that, then we need to have <coughs> some a different scheduling policy. So the second scheduling policy that we are going to look at is called the shortest job first. Among the available jobs at that moment, just choose the shortest job to schedule and just schedule that. Okay, that's the second scheduling policy that we are going to see. And again, it is also a non-preemptive scheduling policy. By that we mean once the scheduling policy started a particular job, it cannot be interrupted in the middle. It just runs to completion. Okay, so in that case, with the same example, shortest job or shortest job first. Now this is going to be because all the three things arrive at time. Zero. Again, we are going to store the same conventions. This is the time of arrival. This is the run time. This is the job. Okay. And so here is going to be. We can just run B or C. Then C. Then twenty, and then we are going to do uh, A or still one twenty. Even though the total time that it takes for the three jobs to complete still remains like 120 seconds, now what we have done is we have basically reduced the turnaround time on an average. So you can easily see that the turnaround time right now is nothing but 10 for job B, 20 for job C, then 120 minus 0, again like 120 for job uh, A, where do we? So it's 150 by 3. So we have basically reduced the turnaround time from 110 to 50 by just scheduling the shorter, the shortest jobs first. Okay. So now, in the same scenario, what will happen if we have something again the same, say A, B, C, with 100, 10, and 10? The arrival times are 0, 10, and 20. So now what may happen in a shortest job for scheduling? What will be the uh, average uh, turnaround time if this is the scenario? This is the arrival time and this is the run time. Are you very calculating? Point time again. Okay. The average turnaround time is going to be 110 again. Yeah, it's going to be 110 again. It's just going to become uh, very similar to the first come first serve because at time zero, the scheduler had no other option because only job that was available at time zero was job A. So it had to schedule that. It had to schedule that. But at time 10, we had B already arrived, but we were not able to schedule. B because shortest job first is a non preemptive scheduling policy. And so it just like uh, kept running A till it completed, even though B arrived at time 10 and C arrived at time 20. It did not do anything, but it just kept on running A and then it ran B and then C. Okay? So again, <coughs> then if, if we have a restriction, like if we can't preempt uh, any job, then the best that we can do is just the shortest job first scheduling policy. Okay? And so now we will go back and we will relax the next assumption. All jobs arrive at the same time. So now we will just, actually we already relaxed this assumption. We relax. Yeah, we just relax this assumption and then when that's when like uh, uh, shortest job first doesn't work anymore. So now we will go and relax the third assumption once started each job runs to completion. Okay. So when we are going to relax this third assumption, then now what we can do in this scenario, okay? So at time zero, again the scenario we are considering is this, okay? Uh, job A arrives at zero, B arrives at ten, and C arrives at uh, twenty. So at time zero, we had no other option. We had to schedule A. You are scheduling A, but at time ten, B arrived. And now we can compare 
this scheduling policy. In this scheduling policy, you can just compare both A and B. What is the time remaining for A? The time that is remaining to be scheduled for A is 90, because it is already scheduled for 10 seconds. So we have 90 seconds compared with whatever we have for B, which is just 10 seconds. And so we just pick, first we preempt the job that is currently running, and so preempt this, and then immediately we run the next job, which is B, which is just for 20, 10 seconds, and at time 20, now again, the scheduler needs to make a decision between A and C, because C also just arrived in the system, and so now out of both A and C, C is the shorter job, and so it's going to like uh, schedule C, and then the remaining time is going to schedule A. And again, total time is again going to be 120. And this algorithm or this policy that we just saw is called the shortest time to completion first. In other words, it's also called the preemptive shortest job first. Again, STCF stands for shortest time to completion first because at every time it's going to make the decision. It computes what is the remaining time in that particular job that, that we need to schedule. Okay? And the other name for it is preemptive shortest job first. So let's now uh, assume with this scheduling policy, what may be the day of the event time. We have something like uh, zero. This is the uh, setup of the workload. A, B, and C arrives at time 0, 3, and 5 respectively, and they have the run times of 10, 7, and 4 respectively. What is going to be the schedule? What is going to be the schedule when we use the shortest time to completion first? Just try thinking about it. Breaks ties. Okay. What's the tiebreaker? If two jobs in the so same you may time. assume like uh, uh, the lexicographic order is the tiebreaker. Like if that's tiebreaker between A and B, then A will be scheduled. Wouldn't you additionally not want to switch in the middle? So you'd also say if you had a tie in the middle, you'd stick. Yeah, that's a very good reasoning actually. So in this particular case, again, uh, that was a very good point. So here. We really need not even worry about tie breaking because if you think about it, if we had like let's say, uh, let's just number this. So from definitely from zero to uh, till three, we know that there's no other option. We only have A to be scheduled. But at time three, we have like we can switch like either schedule A because the time remaining in A is. 7 seconds and the time and the B just arrived and it is also having time of 7 seconds. At that time, <coughs> it is better to schedule A or B. Okay. So assume we don't, yeah, it definitely, it's definitely better to schedule A because we are actually, the context, if we had to schedule B, then we had to do a context switch from A to B. And context switch is not free. By that we mean we saw like how much code that happens in the background and our context which happens, right? So from the perspective of the operating system, it's actually better to just if there are ties, if something is already running, 
then it's better to just continue scheduling them. So in this case, if we had like no other policy specifically saying like this is how you have to schedule when there is a tie, then it's better to just have like A run for let's say till time 5, the A still continues and at time 5 now we have C which just arrived which has like a run time of 4. So the next thing is going to be till 9, till 9 is going to be C and then after that what is going to be scheduled? Okay. Is it going to be A or B? Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be A for uh, uh, 3, four, 5, so it's going to be A for 5 more things, and then at the end it's going to be B. This is how the scheduling curve works. And now, so let's assume at what time A ends, 9 plus 5, 14, what time B ends, 14 plus 7, 21. Okay? <coughs> So now, uh, can you calculate the turnaround time for these three jobs? The average turnaround time, the turnaround time, the average turnaround time for these three jobs. <coughs> yeah, yeah. And just try calculating it for like uh, 30 seconds or a minute. Remember, the turnaround time is nothing but time to completion minus time that it arrives. So can you repeat why? I get why we want to switch from A to B at 3, but why would we switch from A to C at 5? Okay, good. So we did not switch from uh, A to B. So are you clear why we did not switch from A to B? I understand why we would not switch there. I don't understand why we did decide to switch. Yeah, but uh, at time 5, mm -hmm. the remaining time for A was 5 seconds because it had already completed executing like 5 time units. So the total time was 10 there. Okay. For so A, so it needs five more CPU bursts yeah. to finish execution. But C, you just arrived at time five, has only four four CPU bursts. So among the three processes at that time, among A, B, C, scheduler is going to choose C, which is the shortest job okay. at that time. Because they can finish faster. Yeah, so that we can finish faster, and so that we can minimize the average turnaround time. Okay. <coughs> Um, maybe this is too detailed. Hypothetically, if we were doing this policy, would we add some constant factor for the context switch? Like exactly. So in the real world, uh, we would actually, if we are if we are calculating the total time, it would not be just like 21. It would be 21 plus the context switch times, uh, like a factor for the context switch times how many context switches we have made in between. It would be like that in the real world. But here, we just assume that we really don't. Uh, like the context switch time is zero for simplicity. Here, in when, whenever we are discussing the policies, you may assume that we don't have any context switch time unless we explicitly specify something like that. Yeah. I think it's slightly confusing in your diagram that A starts before zero, but that's not reflected in the math. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> A does not start before zero. Uh, this is messed up. Yeah. The thing starts here. There's nothing here. <laughs> okay, so what was the average turnaround time? So for A it's going to be 14 minus 0. For B it's going to be B just got completed at 21, but it arrived in the system at time 3. So 21 minus 3. Plus for C it's going to be it got completed at 9, but it arrived in the system at 5. You may calculate it later, yeah, but this is going to be the turnaround time. Maybe 14 plus uh, 18 plus 4 by 3. 12. I'm not sure. If there are any mistakes, just let me know. Okay. But 12 is the, according to me, 12 is the average uh, turnaround time for these three jobs under the scheduling policy called shortest time to completion first or preemptive shortest job first. Okay, so under uh, these scenarios, like you can preempt any jobs, jobs can arrive at any time, and jobs can have like any length or like it can the runtime of jobs can vary from each other. Okay, under this scenario, do you think uh, shortest time to completion first or the shortest uh, or the preemptive shortest job first this particular thing is it the best thing that we can get for by best here I just mean like uh, optimizing for the average turnaround time 
or can we still do better? particular thing. So, one major problem okay, that was highlighted is uh, if we think about, if we take this particular uh, scheduling policy and if that was a job that had like a runtime of let's say 100 seconds, okay, and but in that system if there were like multiple jobs that were entering the system at every second, then the longest job of let's say or a batch of longer jobs are going to be starved are going to starve because all the shorter jobs that are coming in are immediately going to occupy the CPU. They're going to run, and if that just continues for a long time, the longer jobs will not even get the CPU. Okay, and this problem is a real problem, and it's called starvation. Okay, we are actually basically in this particular scheduling policy, the longer jobs are going to be starved. Okay, that's a very good thing, very good observation. Any other things that uh, you guys notice here, or do you think like based on? The scenario that we have is this the best that we can get. This thing can be or can we minimize the turnaround time even lower than 12? Really important for interactive jobs. 
if uh, the jobs are not interactive, then just the turnaround time would be sufficient. But for interactive jobs, which are like a lot of jobs in the real world, this particular metric is really important. The time uh, response time is nothing but the time was first run minus the time it just arrived. So here, in this particular scenario, what was the uh, response time for A? The T response for A was the response time for A was just zero because it just uh, arrived at zero and it was immediately scheduled. The response time for B was it arrived at time, uh, it was first run at time 14, but it arrived at time 3. The response time was 11 here, and the response time for C is nothing but uh, it arrived at 5 and it was scheduled at 5, so 0. So the average is again going to be 11 by 3. It's the average response time, okay? 11 by 3 is the average response time for these three jobs. So now, in this, uh, with respect to the response time, can we do better than the shortest time to completion first? Can we, whether, just asking, can we even reduce the average response time to be much lower than 11 by 3? Just 3 point or something else. Maybe you can start each job. Pardon? Maybe you can start each job. You can just start each job whenever they come in. Immediately yeah. switch. Yeah, we can do that. So we can just like start each job whenever they come in. And uh, what is the name of the scheduling policy if we just like switch between each jobs at constant intervals of time? Timer. Exactly, it's just called the round robin. And so if we have the same, uh, let's say, <coughs> scenario. Zero. Case, it's just going to be, and we do a round robin scheduling. So this is the fourth scheduling policy that we are looking at. In the preemptive, the first thing that we saw was shortest time to completion first. The second thing that we are seeing is the round robin scheduling. Okay. So when we are going to do the round robin scheduling, here what is going to happen is so till time three, we have no other option. We only have C uh, A to run. But after time at time three, okay. Now since we have like an A, B, and C, now we are not worried about the shortest job. Which is the shortest job? We just pick. Okay, A has run for T three time units till now, and so now I have option of scheduling another job, so I can just start scheduling B. But again, with in round robin scheduling, in round robin scheduling, we have something called the time slice or the time quantum. When there are multiple jobs, what this just means, like when there are multiple jobs that are present in the machine at the same time, how much time can we run each job on the CPU? That's called the time slice or the time quantum. So here, let's assume as of now. This time slice is just one second, okay? Just one in this case. So at this time, since we had like no other jobs, there was no other way. But at time three, we have we can choose between B, A, and B. So we choose B and just run it for one second. At time four, we can run A. Now at time five, again we have an option of running either uh, B or C. Let's assume in this case we run. C because it's not even scheduled once before. And then this process now just continues. So now it's just going to be B, A, C. So yeah, this just goes on till like, uh, let's assume the first thing that's going to get complete is C. And after that, it's just going to round robin between just A and B. Okay? And here, what we have basically done is the turn of the, the, the response time for A is zero. The average we are trying to calculate the average response time. A is zero because it came at zero, it was scheduled at zero. And for B, it also became zero. And for C again, it also became zero. So we just 
made the response time drop to like zero when we just did a round robin scheduling. Whenever a job just arrived, it was immediately picked and it was immediately scheduled. But there are like very uh, a lot of interesting things to think about because here in a round robin scheduling, if we are thinking about how will the jobs be in the background, I mean, what in what data structure will we be having these jobs? It can just be like a simple like an array. Okay? It can just be like a simple array. Or it can be like, a, so in that array, let's assume we had A first. A was, this was what was being scheduled, okay? And then B came in. And so immediately we switched to B. And then C came in. We immediately switched to C, okay? This is like, I'm talking about the data structure internally, which we may be using for implementing a round robin scheduling, okay? And then after C, there was no other thing. So, after, so it was A, B, then it was A, B, then A. Then at this time, it depends. It really depends on how you implement it. So I'm just trying to say here, okay, see here at time, uh, from time 0 to 3, the only option we had was just to schedule A. But at time 3, we got B, so we added a new entry, and we scheduled B. And at time uh, 4, we again had no other way because this just came at time 5, C just came at time 5, so we went back and scheduled A. At time 5, now when C came in, it depends on how we implement this round robin algorithm, okay? You can either add this C to the beginning of this list or to the end of this list, and based on that, there are like some differences. If you think about it, if you are adding it to the end of the list as we just did here, then think about like what may happen. So if you're adding new jobs to the beginning of the list, again, that may be a problem of starvation that may happen. If a lot of new jobs are just coming into the system, and in the list that you're maintaining, if you just keep on, if you just keep on adding those new jobs at the beginning of the list, and whenever a job comes in, if it's going to be scheduled immediately, then the jobs that were already there are going to be starved for some time. Does it make sense? So, but that will not be a problem if you add that job to the end of the list. If you add that job to the end of the list, you, and let's, and assuming that every time you start from the beginning or something like that. Okay, so if there are a lot of ways to actually implement a round robin scheduling, and based on like some simple decisions that we make, we may actually affect the response time and the turnaround time internally. That's like an important thing to think about. Are we Maybe after this discussion, maybe after this project, like, are we, is there going to be any kind of priority, or is it, is this just a priority? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, till now, at least till now, we did not introduce any notion of priority. We are just assuming all the jobs are of equal importance, okay? But the next portion of the class, we will be introducing priorities. We will be like, and even here, just even here, the normal scheduling policies that we just saw, we can actually introduce priorities if, uh, let's say, a, there is something called priority scheduling. This again, just a scheduling policy, which just says that if there are like uh, three jobs, and if one of those jobs, if A is of the highest priority, no other job can run in the, uh, at that particular time until A completes. Only the highest, that is just a scheduling policy again. Only until A completes, no lower priority jobs may run. And if there are like multiple jobs at the same priority, then we can just round robin between them. This is how a uh, uh, priority scheduling policy works. Okay, and there are like a lot more scheduling policies, but these are the most important. What are we going to discuss here? Any questions still now? Question? Yeah, so when you say that there are now, Definitely, we just saw that uh, the round robin scheduling policy is going to decrement or uh, optimize for the turnaround time, right? But then do you think round robin scheduling is the best for all type of workloads or like for all type of scheduling metrics that we just saw? We just saw like two, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you explain? Like, that was a job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. The round robin is the best screening policy for the response time. For the response time. But what will happen uh, when we like try to calculate average turnaround time with the round robin scheduling? It's, not great. it's going to be the worst, right? Because all the jobs, uh, end time is going to like extend as much as possible. Let's assume all the jobs are present in the system at the same time, then since you're going to just run uh, one job per second, it's just going to have the worst turnaround time. Okay? But when we're designing uh, operating system scheduler, and when we are going to like implement a scheduling policy, we can't just like uh, favor either okay interactive jobs. If, if the only jobs that are running on the machine are interactive jobs, then round robin would be the best thing to do. But at the same time, there will also be like uh, <coughs> long running CPU bound jobs, which really don't do any interaction okay, with the user. They just like try to compute something. They just like use the CPU for computing something. And for those long running like uh, CPU bound jobs, that is like, uh, Round robin is not going to uh, actually do any help. It's actually going to increase the time that each and every job is going to end. It's going to delay as much as possible. And so, the just going to take a break now. But after the break, what we are going to do is like we are going to see how can a real world scheduler, which can optimize for both long running uh, CPU own jobs and short running like uh, interactive jobs. How can we design and create uh, policy for something like this? All into that. You starting with that? There you go. In the round robin, in the round robin scheduling policy, what will happen if the quantum is like a very large number, like infinity? If the quantum or tank quantum or the tank slice becomes a very large number. It's not really round robin? Yeah, it's not, it's not really round robin, so what it becomes? What? It just degenerates to a first come first serve, yeah. It just degenerates to a first come first serve scheduling policy. And what will happen if the quantum tank quantum is zero? Yeah, it's like only, you can only, yeah, it's like just imaginary, but we may assume that in the same CPU, like simultaneously all the processes are running. But it's just like not possible. Okay? It's just like uh, not possible to have like a zero time slice because uh, at least the uh, process should run for some finite amount of time so that we can switch to a different process. And usually there is a requirement that. Uh, the time quantum that we choose for the round robin scheduling should be <coughs> some multiple times the time of timer interrupt. So this is the timer interrupt frequency of timer interrupt. Uh, how much time after how much seconds like a timer interrupt happens? So in X V6 it is like 10 milliseconds. So usually the time quantum should be a multiple of the timer interrupt. Because like whenever a timer interrupt happens, that would be a good place to actually switch to a different process. So it can be, let's say, <coughs> like 100, 100 milliseconds is like a very good uh, thing for a quantum, time quantum. But a time quantum cannot be something like 25 milliseconds. <coughs> Jobs use only use the CPUs. Now let's just like try removing this assumption. Now let's assume that the jobs may perform I/O. Assume there is one more process B, 
at the end, which needs to run. Okay. And now we already know that whenever we are going to do some disk I/O or something, it's really so. Here I'm just saying like this happens in the CPU, and here CPU is really not doing anything, but it is just still in the context of the process or the job A. Even though job A is performing some I/O, it's trying to let's say read from a file here, and it's trying to write to that file. Okay, and from the perspective of the scheduler, it just starts A until here it just uses it just like uh, schedules A. But now since we know that uh, I/Os are like very slow and very costly, now we can easily say that whenever a job is performed, whenever a process or a job is performing an I/O. Immediately, instead of just like uh, waiting for the job to complete, <coughs> we just schedule job under job B. E. When job A is performing this, this cooperation, and then maybe when A is done, you may schedule A again. <coughs> in between we may use for scheduling job B. So that now it is like uh, <coughs> maybe the entire time the job B needed was just like these two time units. Only it may even be like by the time the job A was performing an IO, we just uh, used the time, the CPU time that was free for scheduling job B. And this is how usually uh, like real world schedulers do. And <coughs> we are just coming to the last solution. <coughs> Or, which is the worst assumption of all these assumptions. Mm -hmm. So, because it just says the runtime of each job is known. So, if the operating system can really know the runtime of each job, then it can definitely use some combination of shortest time to completion first and round robin to achieve some very good scheduling policies, right? But the problem is, from the perspective of the operating system, whenever a user job is running on the machine, the operating system really has no idea how long the process is going to run. How can the operating system find out if the if the C program that we wrote has an infinite loop? There's no way that the operating system can find that out, right? If it just has an infinite loop, it's just going to run forever, basically. And so this is the worst assumption of all the runtime of each job is known. So we are just removing this right now. Now, then what happens to these scheduling policies? So now, with that assumption being removed, out of the four scheduling policies that we just discussed, now, what happens to these four? Are, they, are all the four still valid? So basically, if you just say, like the shortest job first, and the shortest time to completion first, both just like disappear, that's it, right? We have no way to find out how much time, sorry for like wasting your time with those things, but again, <laughs> they just like disappear, because like we really have no way to find out how much time that a job is going to take, or how much time it need for completion, or any sort of things like that. And so there's no way that we can implement the shortest job first or a shortest time to completion first in a real world scheduling, in a real world scheduler. Yeah. Like a really smart operating system, like try to predict, like based on like well, that's time that you know, like this process ran, you know, maybe it took this time, so I can estimate probably it'll be this. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good thing. So you're just saying like we may probably a uh, smart operating system can probably like estimate. Okay, this job has been running for the past like 100 seconds, so maybe this is a long running job. And this job just got completed in like 10 seconds, so it was a short running job and something like that. We can do some estimations, but we are going to look at a very similar like an algorithm where we just used on these estimations, we, we are going to like uh, get to a real world scheduling policy. So it's, the problem right now is like a big problem. Because if you think about it, we really don't know the runtime of each job, and at the same time, we want to be uh, we want to schedule both these types of jobs in a good way. 
So usually the CPU bone jobs are long running CPU bone jobs. Okay, they are like long running. They may use the CPU for a like very large amount of time. And usually these I/O intensive jobs will be like using the CPU for let's say just like a second, and immediately performing some I/O. Then using the CPU for a second, then immediately performing some I/O. These are like from the perspective of the CPU, these are just like short running jobs. It just needs the CPU for a few seconds, and immediately when it is going to perform the I/O, it is automatically it is just like yielding the CPU right for other processes. So from the perspective of the CPU, these are like very short running jobs. If whenever it starts running, this means limited amount of time. But these CPU bone jobs, whenever they just occupy the CPU, they just occupy for a long amount of time. Okay, and we are trying to optimize for both. We want both these jobs to run in a good way in the scheduler. By that, again, here we are trying to say we are trying to optimize for both minimum turnaround time and minimum response time. So by scheduling these jobs in a good way, what we mean is we are trying to reduce the turnaround time and we are also by scheduling IO intensive jobs which are the interactive jobs in a good way we just mean that we also want to reduce the response time. Can we do this uh, without even knowing the time of each job, this is the actual problem. Okay, the problem is can we do this? People have done it, like in 1967. Okay, they have figured out like a solution for this, uh, like a policy for this. That's what we are just going to like uh, take a look right now. Okay. <coughs> so any ideas from before we just start discussing the particular scheduling course. Any ideas like how can we do this? How can this we may think for a few minutes? How can we uh, write a scheduling policy which can decrease both the turnaround time and the response time and in a way that this doing good for both long running CPU jobs and short running the IO intensive jobs. Could you give different slice times to CPU? Yeah, very similar to that. Yeah, the idea was like if the if the operating system or the scheduler if it can figure out if the job that is running is a long running CPU bone job or if it is a short running job, it can schedule it in different ways. It can just like uh, schedule the long running job without doing any context switch or something like that. And short running jobs, you can just like uh, whenever it is coming to the machine, it can be given some highest priority and just immediately schedule something like that. Okay. No, we don't know. Yeah, that is the problem. Yeah, we really don't know if it is going to be an IO job or it is a long running job. Then how can we find out? Again, as you just told before. Can the user decide the priority? Yeah, so one thing is like when the job just starts using the IO. Okay, whenever the job starts using the I.O., then the operating system can figure out, okay, this is doing a lot of I.O. and it's only using the CPU for a short amount of time. So this may be a, uh, like, I.O. bound job. And if some job is not at all doing I.O. and continuously using the CPU, then it can categorize it to be like a uh, CPU bound job, okay? And again, using all these things, the policy that people came up with, Called the MLFQ. Amazing, amazing design. It's just called multi level feedback queue. Okay? It stands for multi level feedback queue. So here, I'll just give a setup of like how this is going to happen, okay? We may assume there are like uh, some queues, few, let's just for simplicity, let's just assume there are like three queues, okay? Q2, Q1, and Q0. There are three different queues, and the topmost queue is the queue with the highest priority. 
and the lowest views, the their lowest priority views. If there are like let's say jobs, something like uh, in this queue, if there is A and B, if there is the job C, the job B and E here. If this is how the setup is, then there are a few rules for the multi-level feedback queue. So let's just look at the first two queues, don't worry about everything. Just look at the first two rules. Okay, these are the uh, two basic rules that we have in a multi-level feedback queue. This says if there are like multiple jobs, and if the priority of job A is greater than priority of job B, then A should run, B should not run at that time. And second basic rule, this says if the priority of A is equal to priority of B, the two jobs have the same priority, then just run both of them in the round robin fashion. Okay. These are the basic rules that we are starting with. So in this, with this, with these two rules, So what is going to be the schedule like? The schedule here is just going, let's assume all jobs have like some lengths that we really don't know, okay? So it is just going to be scheduled here, with those two rules, it's just going to be A, B. At least until A, B completes, right? Until, at least until A or B, or both actually, both A and B complete, the schedule is just going to be A, B, A, B, A, B on CPU. So that just means the CPU is just going to schedule these two jobs continuously until they are over. Obviously, this is not going to be a good thing because if we are doing this, then the jobs C, D, and E are starving. Okay? So basically what we need here is just we need some way to change the priorities of these jobs so that all the jobs get some time on the CPU. So First problem is how do we change the priorities? Okay. <coughs> so any ideas here? Like uh, monitor response time. What? Monitor response time. Monitor the response time. Yeah, like how long it's been since it's arrived. Mm -hmm. So we could reach some threshold, then we schedule it. Yeah, that's a very good thing. So it's more like uh, idea here is okay when A just arrived. If we schedule it here in the topmost queue, okay. Schedule it for some time, let's assume for some time quantum, and once that particular uh, job has used that particular time quantum for the topmost highest priority queue, immediately just like uh, decrease the priority of the job by one. Does that make sense? So here we are just saying uh, if A, let's assume I'm having the same things here, okay, of time, but we have like three different things here, which is uh, Q2. Q1 and Q0. Let's just assume uh, the time slice for the queue, uh, the topmost queue is let's say 1. The queue is just 1. Any process that the executes here, we can run only for one time quantum. So A comes here, A just runs for one time quantum. And then Q2, we may assume that it is longer, slightly longer. Here it is like 4 or something like this. So in once, if A is the only process running, Okay, then A is going to be scheduled here immediately for two time quantums. Okay, because it has used its time quantum, the topmost queue, we just degraded it or like yeah, we just reduced its priority by one. But in this queue we have two time quantums because it is of lower priority. And then here at the lowermost queue it may have like four time quantums, so it is going to run like this. But at this time, if this is the only job that is present on the machine, okay, we are going to just like run A forever, or A forever at the lowermost priority. But let's assume that at this time, suddenly a job, at this time, suddenly a job B comes in, okay. Now when a job B comes in at this time, we are not going to continue running A here, because there is a job B, and so whenever a job just arrives on the, in this particular thing, now, should we place it at Q0 or Q2 or Q1 also? Do we not have any heuristic? Like? 
Because we really don't know anything about the job of or uh, even game. We're not allowed to examine it or know anything? We really don't know anything. It just arrived into the mission at this time. So we would put it somewhere higher priority for responsiveness? Exactly. So we have to put it like somewhere higher priority because A has already run for a few time slices. And so now the best thing to do is like to maybe put A at the topmost priority. So B. So B just goes here. Now the topmost priority can run for one time unit. Now, what is the next thing that is going to be scheduled? Is it going to be A or B? Based on the first two rules that we had. The basic rules just told that if there is something at the higher priority, we should only schedule that. We cannot schedule the low priority things, right? So now, even though this priority of B decreases, it comes here, it is going to run for two time units here. Okay? So, one more case. And then it is going to drop down to the lowermost thing and run for four time units. At that time, at that time, can, is it possible for A to run instead of B? Yes. It is possible because the <coughs> rules of MLFQ just says that if there are two jobs at the same priority level, all you have to do is just like round robin between those, okay? Now, one more scenario. What happens if the job C just came at this time? Let's assume B has completed this, it has completed this first part, first time quantum in level 2, and C just arrived at this time before B has completed its entire time quantum in the level 2. Again, we are assuming that whenever a job, okay, the one of the rules we are going to see that whenever a job enters the system, we are going to give it the highest priority, okay. And the intuition behind that is, the, since the scheduler really does not know if it is going to be a short running job or a long running job, the scheduler just assumes all the jobs to be short running jobs. Okay? The scheduler just assumes all the jobs to be short running jobs. So it just says, okay, I, I think that you are a short running job, I am giving you the highest priority to run. If you are really a short running job, you are going to get done either at level 1 either at Q2, the highest priority, or maybe at Q1, which is likely at middle priority, and you will be gone, right? You will not even reach the level Q0, the lowermost priority. So if you are really a uh, short running IO job, then you will get done somewhere here and you will be gone. That is the uh, thing that the scheduler is doing right now, okay? But in this case, let's assume A is a CPU bound long running job. In that case, it just scheduled it there, scheduled, try scheduling it here, and again try doing it here, and it just brought it to the lowermost priority and it is still running. So now, this is the feedback, okay? The feedback in the material feedback gives this is the feedback that the scheduler is getting from each and every job, saying like it, whether it is a long running job or is it a short running job. Let's assume. When C came here, we are immediately going to context switch from B to C. B will not run here in that case. When C just came here, B is not going to run here. Instead, C is going to run at this priority because it has the thing for one time slice, right? And if it ran for one time slice and if it was done, then C is done. Then C is like even uh, finished executing. Makes sense? So the next. Uh, rules for how to change the priority are these, okay? The three rules that we have are these. So the third rule says, when a job enters the system, it is placed at the highest priority, which is the topmost queue. This is rule number three. And we have the like, two parts in this rule, in the fourth rule. Try uh, reading this carefully because the next discussion is going to just be based on these. Okay, the fourth A just says, if a job uses up an entire time slice while running, it just means on a, at a particular level, okay, its priority is reduced. <coughs> if a job uses up an entire time slice while running, its priority is reduced. And 4B just says, if a job uses up the CPU before the time slice is up, it stays at the same priority level. <coughs> yeah. Uh, does 4B include blocking the IO? 
Yeah, it includes blocking due to I/O. So, so I mean, includes in the sense it is not calculated as the CPU time. Okay. Just like it just thinks, okay, it is doing some I/O, so it has just yielded the CPU sure. for the processes to use. Okay, so now these are the rules. Uh, do you think these rules would make the scheduler work without any issues, or do we need some more? So let's assume uh, we had those three uh, things before, right? The A, B, and C. <laughs> so the one of the comments was, okay, if let's assume A, initially at this time, it was a CPU bound task, something like that, right? It was the CPU bound task, it was running here, and then it is running here, and then it is running here. But while it is running at the lowermost priority, Assume it wants to do some I.O. It has, after some time, it has turned into an I.O. bone job. It, at that time, in the code, in that process A, it needs to like, perform some I.O., a lot of I.O. But it can only perform the I.O. only if it is able to run, right? But here, if you think about it, A, what can happen to A? Basically, assuming there are like, multiple processes that are entering the system. Exactly, A is going to stop. Just because it has reached the lowermost queue once, okay, just because it has reached the lowermost queue once in its execution, A is going to starve for the rest of the time if a lot of new processes are just coming into the system continuously. So how can we, this is definitely a problem, starvation is a problem with the current set of rules that we have for multi-level feedback queue. So how can we avoid that? We need some means to re-escalate A. Exactly, we just need some way to re-escalate A to some higher priority, right? So that particular the rule that we have here for that is called, let's assume it to be the rule 5, it's called the priority boost. It's called the priority boost. So what this just means is after some time interval T, Okay, after some time interval t, t can be some, let's say, uh, 10 seconds or like even 20 seconds. After some time interval t, just move all the processes in the system to the topmost queue. Okay? If you think about it, it's such an amazing thing. So, it comes down to the lowermost queue and it is running there. And as we just told, suddenly if it turned into an I.O. bone job, and now if it is just pushed to the topmost queue, after some time interval t, when all the jobs are pushed to the topmost queue, so what's going to happen is just like it, now again it gets a chance to be considered as a short running job. If it is, again if A, after this time, if it is really a short running job, it may just remain in the topmost queue. So what do we mean by remain in the topmost queue? I'll just try to explain that, okay? If in this scenario, if there is a job, if A and it came in, uh, Q0, Q1 and Q2 and A just came into the system, if it was running here, let's assume the time slices are here, okay, time 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, something like this, okay. So the time. When A was just scheduled here, uh, if A did not use the entire time slice, let's assume A just used half of the time slice that it was allocated to use at level uh, Q2, okay? And after some time, if it is tried, this time it is doing an I.O. If it is doing an I.O. here, okay, let's assume if it is doing an I.O. here. Then when it again enters the system, okay, when the process A again enters the system, let's say after some time, some other things are happening here, let's assume B is running here, C is running here, some things like that. When A enters the system at this time, it is again going to be given the 
topmost priority. Okay, just if it is just using only half of the time again, then again after some time, it is going to be given the just the topmost priority until it just uses up the entire thing. It is not going to the priority is not going to be decreased. And this is how the I/O intensive jobs, which are just using the CPU for very small time intervals, are actually favored by this particular thing. And if you see the rules 4A now, and sorry 4A and 4B. If a job uses up an entire time slice while running, its priority is reduced. But we just saw here that if this, the A did not use up the entire time slice. But instead, if a job goes up the CPU before the time slice is up, it stays at the same priority level. Okay. Now, are there any issues here? Very similar to how you found out the starvation thing. Are there any other issues here? With these rules. Again, okay, I can tell you the issue is with these two rules here. Can you find it out? So maybe you should think about some evil programmer <laughs> who wants to like take over this system or something. Yeah. Couldn't you write like a Wiley program and use it like 99% of the time slice and then yields? Exactly. Exactly. So if we can write a program, if we find out from the system parameters, if we find out that the topmost priority queues uh, time slice is let's say uh, one second, okay. And if someone writes a program that it voluntarily, even though it is really not doing any I/O, if that program can voluntarily yield the CPU because there is a thing called yield, we can just call yield and let or like sleep or anything like that. If it voluntarily yields the CPU after like 99 percentage of the time slice, so what will happen in that case is very similar to here. It's just going to be let's assume A is that evil process. It will use till here. Okay, it will just not use that last one percentage of the time. It's going to use till here, even though it is really not doing any I/O. It is just going to yield the CPU, and immediately when it is coming back, let's assume. If it's going to immediately be scheduled somewhere here, then it's again going to start here and it's going to use till here, then just not use the last little thing because if it uses that, it's going to be bumped down to a higher priority level. And so it just follows this particular pattern and can just, this particular process can just stay at the highest priority level even though it may be a, even though it may be a CPU bound task. So if A only uses the first half of the time slice, does another, and then B gets to take over? Yeah, exactly. So does it have to stop at one, or does it get to keep going? No, like, no, no. It, it okay. just like the context switching immediately starts at, let's say, wherever A, start, A stops. So it's not like these time units that we have is, uh, so I'm just saying yeah. a new process can be scheduled even somewhere in, in the middle, like 0.5 or something like that. So then it would be 0.5 to 1.5. Yeah. Okay. Exactly, it will be like that, yeah. This is just for simplicity, I just assume these things. So this is called this particular problem with the multi-level feedback queue. Okay? It's called gaming the schedule. <laughs> Can easily write a program to gain the scheduler using something called like the things called yield. So we need yield. Or sleep. Just sleep there. Yeah. And we yield. And then B is like the time for a little bit, and then it would pick up its time slice between the Be lowered to priority level 2 and at 
at that time, when A is scheduled again, if A and B are the only two processes in the machine, then B is just going to stay at the Q, the second Q or Q1, and B is just going to monopolize the CPU. So at this time, when B just came here, I'm just saying B would run here. It's a good thing it's going to take the entire time slice. So B uses the entire time slice. Immediately, B will be reduced to this particular. And okay, A again runs one more time. Then now, when B is scheduled again, since it has already used up the time slice completely at this level, B is going to run here. Okay, maybe one time it's going to run here, but that is that may be the last time it even runs, because after that. If A is a long running job, just A is going to do this continuously. After this, again, even though it yields here, okay, even though it yields here, now the scheduler needs to make a decision. At this point, scheduler needs to make a decision between A and B. Since based on the first rule, A has higher priority than B, obviously it's going to schedule A again here, and it's going to just again yield the CPU just before like the one thing. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, sorry, I'm wrong here. So B actually gets. So this is actually two time units because we just told like this goes like one, two, and four, right? So this gets run. This gets to run for like two time units. Why would it run? No, on? sorry. I think it is wrong. Yeah, I think I messed up here. <laughs> I think we will not even run basically at the second level. It will just run here. Think about it. It runs here. This is correct, okay? But this is wrong. Because B will not even be able to run here because A is already there. B's priority is reduced, but A is already there at priority, at the topmost priority. So it's going to be A from the B's only chance was here. A is still just going to monopolize the CPU from this point on continuously. Until so until now A completes, there's no way that B can run. In order to monopolize the CPU, A had to stop just before the time slice is up. Yeah. And if it stops just before the time slice is up, won't we jump in and take a full time slice? Only if it was a okay. block. Yeah. yeah, only if there was some other. So I'm not sure. Can you repeat the question one more time? So if A yields before the time slice is up, why doesn't B jump in and then B gets a full time slice even if it's a lower priority? No. So when, when that happens, okay, when A yields, we are not running B because now MLFQ has a, to make a decision between A and B. The schedule has to make a decision between scheduling A and B. But A already yielded. But it just yielded. By yielding, we again just go back to the ready queue. We are not going to the block queue. What yielding the... just means like sleeping or like so, something like I'm yielding the CPU voluntarily. So. Yeah, so exactly. We have, to, we have to assume that when a program that's nice yields, it's actually going to go off and do something else and not go straight into ready. It just goes back to the scheduling. This is why we don't so, care about yields. We use interrupts. Yeah, we really don't use yield. But the idea here is like, if it is that in the the thing that we will use in turn is just sleep. Okay, we can think of it to be sleeping for let's say that point one second or something. Just sleeps for that point one second. It sleeps for a very small amount of time. So when we call sleep, okay, it actually it is going to the block queue and then again immediately after the small amount of time it will be taken to the ready queue. But while it's in the block queue, would the scheduler during that point one second pick something that was ready? So yeah, it is possible, yeah. That is so possible. It would take B for a time slice because then the scheduler would be called again until the end of the yeah, it depends on where, in which queue A is being placed. If A is being placed in the block queue, then whatever you are saying... So yield, though, doesn't place in the block queue. So it's really not like sleep. Well, if, if you yield for, like, a, you can pass it in, like, a time. So you can say, like, sleep 5,000, or you can just say sleep 1. And so it, it doesn't matter, though. I'm saying there has to be a finite amount of time that it pauses, and that is enough time for the scheduler to grab something else, even if it's at a lower priority. What if that time what is, is no. like one or two CPU cycles where it hasn't finished switching context before it comes back? I don't think a user mode program has to interrupt a context switch, right? Am I wrong about that? Pardon? A user mode program? A user mode program can't interrupt the kernel from switching context. But it's not a user mode program at that point, it's a system call. 
So okay. you, you craft it as a system call, say, set me a timer interrupt to undo this, and set me a ready after some number of CPU cycles. That would be I, I, I know how many CPU cycles it takes to get to the context switching because of all of this, and so as long as I sleep for less time than it takes to complete a context switch, I can grab my pro or before we get to the part where it assigns a new process, I can get myself back into the queue on the highest level priority. Now, personally, I don't know if a sleep timer interrupt interrupts the context switch interrupt. I don't. Just, just okay, so whenever we call a sleep, okay, so I'm just trying to explain. <laughs> so when a sleep happens, we are going to like, uh, the process is going to be moved from the running state to the block state for that amount of time, it's going to stay in the block state for the sleep duration and immediately this, once the sleep duration is done, it's going to be brought back to the ready state. Okay, this is what is going to happen. The idea here is when the, if if you're only talk, even if you're only talking about sleep, if the time that it goes from the running state to the block state and back to the running back to the ready state, within this time, if the scheduler has not even finished like uh, running the scheduling policy to choose the next thing to be scheduled, you understand? If the scheduler is still running its loop for loop to trying to figure out which one should I schedule next. Before that time, A will again come back to the ready queue. So when a process goes back to the ready queue, does the scheduler start over? Like it's notified and starts over with the new information? So that depends on the scheduler. So it is like uh, when, uh, so in, the, in, in this particular scheduler, when the scheduler is going, it's definitely going to start over because the rule is if there is one process at higher priority level, you should definitely choose that when compared to. So it will it will lock the queue, but again, then you are trying to say like uh, before even it locks the queue. Oh. I mean, these are like very good questions, but <laughs> we don't need to worry about at this level of detail. But yeah, so yield again, I am trying to say yield just like is like saying voluntarily. I am just yielding the CPU. I am done with my execution as of now. I may come back at some time. You may schedule me after some time, but as of now, I am just yielding the CPU. Silly question. Threads don't actually matter in this, right? Since we're only discussing at the process level? Yeah. So, we have about threads yet until we move to the concurrency part. It's going to be more interesting. Okay, so how can we change these rules or update these rules so that someone we can avoid someone from gaming the schedule? You could track the amount of time that you have worked. That would add overhead, but then you would never be able to game the scheduler. Exactly, so that is the solution. So instead of just keeping track of, uh, so if the job uses up entire time slice, this is wrong, okay? While running, its priority is reduced, right? So it's more like whenever the job is scheduled, we just keep like a global counter for that particular topmost queue, and it will be done in the sense. We're not going to reset the counter every time the job is scheduled one more time. So the poor process A now what will happen is it will start running here. Let's assume the time slide, the time units are like here. It will start running here till like here. But since now we have modified our scheduler, the next time it gets it to run, let's say somewhere here or something, it just gets to run for the remaining time here. That's it. And we will need to be, it is going to be bumped down to the lower priority. So A is here, then A is here, then even if A is the only process on the mission, A is going to start running from here for two time slices. And again, which is the lowermost level for four time slices. Again, these are just arbitrary numbers that we are using, like one, two, four. But yeah, the idea is we are just calculating the total time that it uses at the topmost at any priority level. So that even if someone yields the topmost priority level, 
we are going to figure that out and then we are going to account the total time and then immediately bump down the process with one priority. Does this make sense? And uh, this is so, okay, the priority boost. The rule 5 was after some time period, yes, move all the jobs in the system to the top first queue, which we already saw. After some time period, T or yes, just bump all the jobs to the top most queue. Will, the problem was to avoid starvation and for better accounting, the modified rule 4 is just nothing but once a job uses up its time allotment at a given level, its priority is reduced here by time allotment. Again, we just mean that the time slice for that particular level immediately its uh, priority is reduced. We don't worry about it each and every time that we are doing that particular job.
It's like one of the most interesting projects. <laughs> and again, it's not like uh, uh, really complicated. Just first think, first we should find to, we should try to understand how the current schedule is implemented, and then it will be just like little modifications uh, of the scheduling logic. And uh, yeah, at the end, it will be like we will be at least. Uh, simulating a multi-level feedback queue, but again, really don't worry about creating some queues in C and stuff like that, okay? So we'll be discussing more about this in the project discussion, but again, we'll be simulating a multi-level feedback queue scheduler in x 6 uh, with all these rules, with all these five rules that we just had here. So quickly, I think I'll just go uh, walk you through the scheduler uh, in x 6 So this is the scheduler for the process CPU scheduler. Each CPU calls scheduler after setting itself up and scheduler never returns. It loops doing choose a process to run, switch to start running that process, eventually the process transfers control via switch back to the scheduler. Okay, this is our scheduler code and all it does is it just starts an infinite for loop here. It's just going to run forever and inside this infinite for loop just enable the interrupts on the processor. Don't worry about this as of now and we immediately start acquiring a lock. Okay? And uh, these details we will talk about in concurrency because if we have two CPUs then like if one scheduler runs on each CPU, okay? There is like one scheduler for each CPU, which does make the scheduling decisions for that particular CPU. And when this is a scenario, both the C both the schedulers that are running on these two, two CPUs are trying to access the same uh, process table here. Okay, one thing I think we haven't discussed till now is. Uh, we have something called a process table. Okay, if you see here, it's like trying to loop in a process table. We'll just try to see what this is. So you see here, it's just a structure with a log and with a array of m prox. It's just a structure with the log and with some array of m prox. And this m prox. is nothing but 64. So in our simple little world of xv6, okay, 64 is the maximum number of processes that can run at any point in time. That, the, uh, that can run simultaneously at any point in time. Because we only have a fixed length array of 64, of size 64. And that, that array, that, which is called the P table, is nothing but uh, Arrays called the P table or the process table, which is nothing but like a fixed set of array from 0 to 63, and you will be having like PCBs here, pointers to PCBs, basically PCB for the first process, PCB of P1 or P0, PCB of P1. This is the process table. So this scheduler, what it is trying to do, or scheduler, is just start from this first entry in this process table, okay, and just loop through to each and every entry till it reaches the end. And if it reaches the end, it just comes back. So that's all the scheduler is trying to do. But let's see, like, uh, what is happening here. So there is a loop which starts from the first entry in the process table, 
and it goes till the last entry, and then it goes like one by one, one process at a time. It just checks if the state of the process is not runnable, okay, if it is not in a ready state, basically, we immediately continue. So what will this do? It, we just like go back to the same, the next element in that particular table, right? We just go back, we just don't execute any code that is below this, but just go back to the next element in this particular table and see if it is runnable. Let's assume if this particular process, the PCB that we are looking at right now, if it is runnable, then we just come here, switch to chosen process. It is the process's job to release. Don't worry about the locking as of now, okay? But just assume now the proc that we have here, this proc is the process that we are going to schedule. So we just chose P. We just saw that P is runnable right now. So immediately we just assign proc to be P. And so immediately after that, the switch UVM is stands for switch to the user virtual memory, which we will be discussing when we talk about memory. Don't worry about that. We just change the state of the process to be scheduled to be running. Okay, this is where the state changes. And immediately once it changes the state, this was some print that I added for some debugging purposes. Don't worry about it. And we immediately after changing the state, we call the switch routine giving in two contexts. The first context that we give in is the scheduler's context, switch just gets in uh, from switching from, the second thing is switching to, okay? Switching from is the CPU scheduler, and switching to is this prox context, okay? We already saw like how the switch code works at some level of detail, but I also sent a video uh, of the same to go into like much more lower level details. Again here, okay, okay. So when switch happens, the, the interesting thing here is we are not going to, once switch is complete, we are not going to execute line 278, right? Because we are going to what? What are we going to execute when after switch happens? Let's assume switch completes. After switch completes, where will we be executing? In the process A. So we will be executing somewhere, okay, inside this process A. That's what switch does. So the control just now switched from scheduler to process A. Okay? And process A may be scheduled, it may run some things, and let's assume process A was interrupted due to a timer interrupt. Again, we come to some uh, like the yield thing, right? We come when the time interrupt happens, the flow again reaches yield, and when it reaches yield again, there's a switch there from the process A to the scheduler. And that is the time when line 278 is going to be executed. Okay, so the scheduler takes control again. Now after the scheduler takes control, it just switch KVM means switch to the kernel virtual memory. We'll be discussing these things when we study about memory in the next part of our class, starting next week. And then we just what, uh, we are just like resetting this block to be a null pointer because we just scheduled that. We really don't want it to have some values before we go back and choose a different block. Okay, so we just set it to a null pointer or zero, and then we continue this loop now. Once we continue this loop, we are just going to go and find the next runnable process, and we are just going to schedule it for some time quantum, which is nothing but in this case, which is the time interrupt, right? Whenever the time interrupt happens, we are going to switch back to the scheduler. And so, what scheduling policy is used in X physics currently? Exactly, with the time slice of? Exactly, so we are just having like a round robin scheduling policy in X physics with the time quantum of the time interrupt. Does it make sense? And this is where you are going to work for the next few days in your life here. This part of the code is where you are going to like modify for making this simple scheduler, simple block dropping scheduler to become a, a multi-level field IQ. And almost like, a, so the number of lines that you would be adding is definitely not like, it's not even going to be more than maximum like, like 200 or something. It's not more than that, but the amount of understanding that you need to 
do is like a lot. And this applies to all X V six projects. All X V six projects, the amount of code that you are going to change is like very little when compared to the Linux uh, part of the project that you are doing, the A parts. But for the X V six part, it's more about understanding code, trying to understand each and every detail of what is happening because when you just forget to like change something, immediately the kernel will panic and there will be some error messages thrown, like trap, some numbers and stuff like that. Are the C parts of the projects intended to be connected in any way or is it just totally... Yeah, they will be connected. So usually, so for example, uh, in the next part of today's lecture, we are going to discuss about how to create new processes and stuff. And so in, this, in the C part of the second project, we are going to create your own shell program. Like the terminal, basically. Okay. Yeah, so this is what is happening. And so now we go back again and then choose the next runnable process. If there's no other runnable process, the same process is going to be chosen and then it is going to be scheduled for more time. And so, an interesting thing to note here is like, even though there is just a single process that is running on XV6. Okay, a question, a question on the exam can easily be if there is just a single process that is running on XV6, uh, would context switch happen or will it just keep on running? Yeah, so yeah, if we if we define the context switch, to even be like a context switch from the some from some process to the scheduler, yes, that is going to happen. Yeah, so it's going to be like A, then scheduler, then A, then scheduler. And that pattern is going to continue. Um, so it has to remember the p variable, right? Is that one of the things that's on like the OS kernel stack that gets saved before it switches? Exactly. So these all, almost all the variables that we see here, the p variable, the proc thing. All these variables are on the OS's address space. They are in the operating system's address space. What does it mean? It can be if it's a some static variable, it will be in the static part of the OS's data. If it is in some function, it's going to be in the kernel stack of the operating system. And if it allocates some, if we go inside the some memory allocations, we will see like it will be using some uh, function similar to emmalloc but it will be like something called k or something like that which actually allocate memory but they will be allocating memory in the kernel part of the address space for the operating system to use. Okay, I think uh, it's maybe a good time to uh, take a break. Uh, let's again take like... Uh, Last part of today's class, we are going to discuss uh, <coughs> process APIs. <coughs> the first thing that we are going to see is like, until now we are talking about different processes that we run on a machine and stuff like that. How can we, as users, how can we create? Processes. Okay, that's the first question we are trying to just How can we create processes? Okay. And the operating system gives us a functionality to do so, or a system call to do so, and the name of the system call is fork. It's called fork. And this may be one of the uh, interesting system calls that you may have seen till now. Because what it is going to do, I will try to explain. So let's assume there is some process P that is running. Okay. If when process P calls this particular system call four, if it calls this four, immediately process P is going to create one more process which looks like it is exactly like the clone of the process P. It just creates another process which is very similar to process P. It has some differences. The differences may be if this has a PID of let's say 2, and this process will have the next PID, PID of 3. But other than that, the if this process, <coughs> the code, the code, data, stack, and heap, okay, 
or the, the entire address space of the process B would just be copied as it is, just be copied as it is in the other process B, okay, with the DID of 3. And you may, for our discussion, okay, at a high level to understand this, uh, we may assume that this is our terminal, okay, this is our terminal, and this particular terminal is nothing but it is just a user level program. It is just a user level program, the terminal or the shell, okay, it's the shell of the terminal, it's just a user level program that is running, which is prompting you to type some commands. And when some user types a command, let's say pwd, and presses enter here, okay, immediately what is happening internally is, we have this shell program, we have the shell program, shell immediately calls fork, shell forks itself, okay, comes fork, and then it creates another shell program. So immediately it calls this thing, it calls another shell program. And at this time, okay, this is again high level details, okay, at this time what will happen is inside this particular shell, shell program, so this is called the parent, and this after working we just call, we just call child. Okay. Inside this child, which as of now, after this fork, it still has the same core, data, stack and heap, but internally we will call one more system called, called exec. <coughs> we will call a system call called exec, which is also very interesting and usually used along with uh, fork, okay? And what exec does is, it tries to find out okay, what is this program that they are trying to execute in the shell. It just overrides this particular program's code, data, code and data, okay, with the code and data of the program PWD. Again, PWD, the print working directory or the present working directory, this is nothing but again, it is just internally, it's just a C program or a user level program called PWD or C. Shell is again just a user program or shell.c or sh.c. You can even like view these programs in x 6 Then now exec just took the code and the data from the executable of the program pwd and just overwrote on top of this. And this is the time, okay, this is the time when this child process becomes pwd. Okay, it becomes pwd. It does the work of PWD, it executes the code of PWD, which is just to print the current working directory. It prints it, let's assume it prints it here. Slash home, slash, uh, it prints this. Then what happens is, it has done its work, okay? Then this process is terminated, this process is terminated, it has finished its job then the control reaches back to the parent process. That's when we see the prompt again. This is what is happening internally. Okay. So now we are going into much more details about this fork. Okay? Let's first take fork and see like how it really works. So here, in here, what we are going to do is just like, uh, just use a printf, saying like, uh, I am and the parent, and the PID is nothing but, uh, so we are just trying to print the PID of this particular process, 
get the BID. For BID, we need like a This is the random parent and my PID is 2240 because we are running it on Linux. The, we get like some larger PID because there are so many other processes that are already running. Okay? And now, now this is the interesting part. Okay? We are just going to call this system call called fork. Okay? When we call the system call, we are trying to store its return value, let's say in a variable called RC. Okay? The return code. Okay? We are storing return code in this variable called RC. Now, let's, so what happens here is, okay, so the important thing to note here is when we call fork, immediately there are two processes that are currently running, right? SH.C, which is running as SH, and there will be another SH that is running concurrently. And when there are two processes that are running, one is the parent process, another is the child process, okay? The way that we would be able to distinguish between the parent and the child process is only using this return code. So it is very interesting because even though we just called fork in just the parent process, okay, fork is being called only once, but fork is going to return twice. Okay, fork is going to return twice, once in the parent process and once in the child process. Okay, let's see that right now. So let's have like a condition saying like uh, if the return code is greater than zero. Here I'm just trying to see. Okay, there are two times fork returns, and in the parent process when the fork is returning, it just returns the PID of the child. Okay, it just returns the PID of the child. In the child process when fork is returning, PID is just again the process identifier. Okay? And in the child process, when the fork is returning, it is going to return zero. So that is the only way in which we can figure out: Are we going to run the parent process or the child process? Or based on that return code, we can do separate things. You can do like a set of instructions if it is a parent. You can do another set of instructions if it is a child. Okay? Let's see that here. Uh, if RC is greater than zero, because all PIDs will be greater than zero. So we are we are just assuming okay if this is greater than zero then we will be in the parent process. Else if RC is equal zero then we know that we are in the child process. So let's just print something here okay print uh, let's copy this here. Just copying this here and then similarly copying. But now it's going to say because it's zero, it's going to be in the child process and yeah. And if the else case is nothing but the negative value, and by negative value here we mean that fork fails, okay? In that case, we may can do a printf. that uh, uh, fork will not fail in Linux, you can assume that to be the case, uh, and we have these two things. So now, when we run this piece of code, okay, can someone guess what is going to happen? Will it print I'm the child first? Pardon? Will it print I'm the child first? So there are like uh, oh. three lines here, right, 6, 11, and 13. 
Six, thirteen, and eleven. Six, thirteen, and eleven. It's definitely possible. Can we like count? I mean, does it wait? Is it asynchronous, or is it synchronous? When you call it? So it's asynchronous because it just like once the fork happens, there are two processes, and it's only with the scheduler. The decision is only with the scheduler to. It can schedule either of those two processes to run. If it schedules the parent process, then line. So okay, line six is definitely going to be printed. Okay. After that, it really depends if it is going to print line 11 first or line 13. And it's really funny because the, if you see here, line 11 and 13 are in an if-else statement. Usually, only either if works or else works, but here both if and else works because we are actually running it in two separate processes. Make sense? Okay, so let's try this. But I think we need to add some more header files. Okay, let's try compiling this. So with four, is that assuming X is as four? So would that fail if you already had like all six and four processes filled up? Exactly, four will fail. So in X V six, if you have the count of sixty-four processes. When you call when you call four, four will fail. Okay, because you are at the maximum process limit. Okay, so but right now we are running in Linux, so we need to worry about those details. And so now when we try running a search, so can you see here? It says I am the parent, and my PID is two four nine nine. Says I am the parent, my PID is two four nine nine. I am the child, PID is two five zero one. Okay. So this shows that the parent started, and the first thing that was scheduled was the parent, okay? And then what was scheduled was the child process. The child was scheduled next. Well, Any after questions something here? else, but there's a 2500, presumably. No, so we cannot like really assume it, it will be the next immediate integer. Mm -hmm. It just like it tries to monotonically increase that may have internally may have allocated that particular PID to some other internal process that was running at that time that was created between these two or something like that. Okay. So the fork starts the next process at the line that fork is called. Exactly. Obviously it doesn't create infinite forks, but yeah. So it will like uh, that's a very good question. So where does the child process the other way to frame that question is? So the parent process starts running at line number five, right? But where does the child process start running? The child process, can someone guess? In this piece of code, where does the child process start its execution? Or when the child process runs, assuming these line numbers are the addresses or something like that, what is going to be the value inside the EIP, the instruction pointer in the child process? Uh, it should be pointing to the instruction that's setting RC. Exactly. So internally, there will be like some instruction that sets this return code RC. Okay. That sets this return code. That will be that instruction that will be executed. So basically, returning from fork is the first instruction that is going to be executed in a child process, which is like weird. We did not even call fork then. I mean, we did not even call fork in the child process, but it starts from returning from fork, and then it starts proceeding to whatever we have here. And why does the same piece of code gets run in both parent and the child? Because child at this time is nothing but just an exact replica of the parent. The code, data, stack, and heap is exactly the same in both the parent and the child. Does it make sense? Great. So with that, then what we can try doing here is like I just told you, four will return the um, PID of the child in the parent, right? We want to just confirm that, we can just say, I am the parent, my PID is this, something like this, okay? My PID is this, then child or CID, we just have a CID, child ID, child ID is percentage D, and you can just try printing the return code here. Okay, I'm just trying to print the return code here just to confirm if that's true. So you can just see here. Now if you see it is more money, got the immediate next number, but again it's not you can't assume anything here. 
So I am the parent, my PID is 2600, my child's PID or C ID, child ID is 2601. We just printed that from the return code. So, and if you want to confirm if the child returns, in the child it returns zero, you can try printing this thing here. The return code in the child, percentage D, and here it just says, The child, we just got a return code of zero. So child in child we get a value of zero and in parent we get a value of uh, the PID of the child. Okay? That's how using that is the only way we can differentiate between the child and the process and do different code paths for each. Basically. Okay? Now we just told the code data and everything is just copied as it is, right? So what may happen if we have like an integer here? Oh, okay, one more question here, okay, one more question, if, if I have like another printf here, take a hello world, okay, if I have a printf here, like line 10, hello world, how many times is going to be printed? Twice, yeah, once in the parent and once in the child, because that is not inside any of these conditions, so it's just going to be printed twice once from the parent's process and once from the child process. Because whatever is below here is going to be executed both in the parent and the child. Okay, whatever is below this line 8. So now, one more question then. Uh, what happens if we have some num variable initialized to 0? Okay, And if we change that variable in the parent to be, let's say, num equals 1. and But in the child, we change it to num equals 2. Now what may happen? Again, the idea here is, or the higher idea here is, so we just told that uh, we have like an address space, it's the code data key and stack, and these are being just copied as it is to the child, okay? And so when it is being copied as it is, uh, we have like another replica here. So now almost everything is going to be the same. Can someone guess like what may happen when we just change that num from, it was zero initially in the parent, and then the parent changes it to one, but the child changes it to two. So it's just like at that time, so if the num variable is here, okay, num variable is stored here, this is the parent and this is the child here, in the data, so it will, it will not be actually in the data section, it is going to be in the stack section, okay, because it is like a local variable there on the stack, it's not a static variable, so it's going to be here, and so here it's going to be 1, but in this thing almost, but all, even though the other stack remains the same, this variable's value is going to change to 2. So num's value is going to be different in both the parent and the child. So basically what we're saying is at the time of fork it's going to just use this exact copy but after that it depends, like the child can go and modify whatever it needs, okay? It can, the amazing thing is it can even modify this code section altogether. We need to have the num kids set before the fork so that it's on the parent's stack before it gets calculated. Exactly, so I just... You have it. So what are you asking like, uh, so you are asking like inside this if condition, what if, if we have this num equals zero, right? Right, well so I'm asking, do you need to have int num equals zero before the fork happens to say that it gets copied over the stack from the parent? Oh, sorry, 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 yeah. Here I actually intended to have it like uh, before the yeah, yes, exactly. So this was what I was intending to show, okay? The again, num equals zero was there like even before we fork. So at that time of fork, in both the parent and the child, it's going to have a value of zero. But after we execute the parent and the child, it's going to both are going to change its value as they need it. Okay. Okay. So now 
uh, as of now, we really don't have any control over how we uh, schedule these processes, right? Parent runs and the child, uh, in our case, it was like, uh, how did it run? Okay, we are not printing this now, and so it is like throwing some error. <laughs> so now it just shows that uh, so I'm the parent and hello world, and then uh, I'm the parent, my PID, child's PID, hello world from the child, I am the parent, PID, written code, okay? This is what's happening to me, yeah? So, uh, is it possible that the in this execution the parent could have run into, like, could the parent be preempted and we get two hello worlds? Exactly, it's definitely possible here, okay? It's definitely possible that the parent, after let's say uh, printing hello world, the scheduler could have just preempted the parent and it, it could have run the child process. And so at that time, it would have been like hello world, then immediately hello world, then maybe if the child completes, this will be done, and then the last thing would be this. So we really don't have any control over the order of execution. The only control we have is that we can be sure that this line will be the one that is always that is printed first. But that is printed like even before the fork. Yeah, after fork we really don't have any control as of now. But if we don't have any control, then how can we, because we are thinking that we are, we are writing a shell program, right? We are writing a shell program, we give a command, and that command, like we fork the shell, and now that shell becomes that particular command, like pwd. We have, the shell needs to wait for that command to print its output and then only the control should transfer back to the parent process which is the shell, right? So basically the parent needs to wait for the child process to complete. Is that correct? And so, the, that is the way we can do so. And the system call that we have for doing so is called the wait system call. Okay? It's just called the wait. Usually, the wait system call takes in a pointer to an integer, okay? And if you take in, if you provide some pointer to an integer or some address of an integer here as the argument, in that particular integer, you will get the exit status of the child. So once the parent, when the parent starts executing again, you can go and look at the value in that, inside that integer to find out did the child exit normally or did the child exi exit due to some errors or did someone press control C and uh, terminated the child and stuff like that, okay? But we are not going to worry about those things. Instead, we are not going, instead we are just passing null. Okay, we are not worried about that particular status. So we are just saying wait null. Wait, system call waits for a child process to complete, okay? So in this case, when we do this, now let's try running this. So can you see here, now what just happened? First line is printed after the hello world. Hello world was even printed before that, okay? So it is definitely going to be printed there. And so first, let's see the code one more time. So this is going to be printed first line 6, then we do a 4. Since it is here, at this time we did not have any control, okay? Of asking the parent to wait for the child or something. And so the parent printed this hello world. Just to be like, uh, maybe slightly more clear, we can just add the PID there to see like from where are we printing this hello world. Okay, I'm just adding the PID here. So now it will be going to be like PID of the parent says hello world and then uh, when we come, even if child is scheduled first, we have this wait system call. Wait system call basically tells the parent to wait till the child finishes execution. And so now the child starts executing. It prints the I am the child, changes this num, and then after that, the wait system, the parent will return from the wait system call. Whenever a parent enters the wait calls wait system call, it will immediately be blocked parent process will be sent to the blocked queue until the child, the state changes, child should finish execution. Once the child finishes execution, the parent will again start assuming to run. Start assuming to run. So now if you see here, so can you see here now? Yeah, like, uh, so first the parent printed hello world here, 
then immediately the child printed hello world, okay? Because at this time, the parent was not able to print this line, I am the parent, because we had a wait system called before that it was just blocked to there. When the child started executing, child started executing from this hello world line, then it printed the child this thing, and it was there. What happens if the process has more than one child? That's a very good question. So a process can have multiple childs, okay? And we have another system call called wait PID. In that wait PID system call, we can specify for which child do you want to wait for. The first argument will be the ch PID of a child. So, so does wait without that just get the next child? Exactly. It just waits for one child process. Let's assume in this case, if we have like three child processes for this particular parent process, then this wait system call just waits for any child process that first gets completed. So is, is there any like error checking on wait PID? Could I could I pass in process one and just lock everything up beautifully? So I think I'm not very sure about it. Maybe we should read the man pages for that, yeah. <laughs> so if that is the case, then it may think like Assuming like how they may have implemented that, it may think that process one is your child and it may just maybe wait for it or maybe it will immediately do a check if that is really your child, else it may like immediately return. And I don't know like how they would have implemented that, yeah. Um, Some arguments to the program. Okay, so in this case, let's assume we are going to use 
like a similar character array, like an array of character pointers or something here. Just copy it and let's have it as the argument to the child, okay? Uh, or C args, okay? Uh, C args, child arguments, okay? This is the argument we're going to pass to the child. Let's just create it as a static array here. And let's just assume we have something like C args of zero is going to be the name of the program that we want to like actually do. Let's assume we type PWD as we just saw. Since we are assuming we are creating a shell program here, <coughs> and then the next thing, PWD usually does not take any arguments, right? And so we really need not worry about it. And if it takes some arguments, maybe I will show a command that takes some argument. Let's assume. Okay, let's just start with PWD. If there are no other arguments, okay, after that you may just type none because this uh, array of character pointers should be terminated with a none pointer. Okay, that's how except we understand. Okay, the arguments has ended. The arguments to this particular program has ended. In this case, we will assume that there is no arguments. Only the name of the program is given. And in except, all we have to do is. Let me choose that inside. Sorry, yeah. In this case, it should be just two. Okay, since there are no arguments here. And so in this case, in the program's name is in C R of 0. And then you pass the entire array, entire uh, thing here. Yeah, it's in C R S. For C R S, it means like, okay, now we have the entire thing. If you remember, whenever C program takes the R V, okay, it's going to the first argument is going to be the name of the program, right? That exactly is replicated here. The same design is also followed here. First argument is name of the program, and then other arguments are some command line options that we have for that particular C program. Okay. So with this, now let's try running our files. Okay, did you just see what happened? I'm the parent, then the hello world, two times I am the child, suddenly the child did something great. It just transformed, okay? It just transformed from being the sh.c or the sh executable. Suddenly, it just transformed into a program called pwd. And it just printed the working directory, and then we moved to the parent again, and the parent finished its execution. Yeah. When well, it transforms, does it lose all of the information of that way? Can you pass, could you have passed that array as a blank? Or is it as a blank? So you can still pass that. And we can pass things from the parent to the child. And I meant from the child into the PWD program that it transformed into. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I can show that right now. So if some, let's assume if there is some command like ls, okay? Yeah. It takes like some arguments like hyphen l, right? Yeah. We can pass those arguments along with that. If that is what you're asking, or the question is something different, can you repeat? I'm not 100% sure. Okay, maybe you can discuss it after class. Yeah. yeah. Like we could pass known into the child or other things from the parent into yeah. that program. So here, okay. here let's assume now change, let's change this to something different. Let's say ls, let's change this to 3, so that now this is not going to be null. Second thing is going to be null, but instead let's do a long listing of files. So the second argument is going to be an l, right? So we just do this. Now we are transforming this child process to ls hyphen l. You see that after the child, the output is just the output that we usually get from the long listing of files in the current working directory. So the child's code segment, the idea here is the child's code segment and static data is being completely replaced by the code in the static data from a program called, in this case, ls, okay, from a program called ls. And how does exec, this exec vp, in exec vp, uh, this version of exec finds that ls is present in some directory, <coughs> finds that this ls is present in some directory like slash bin or slash user slash bin. These are the two directories usually that we will find the binary, BIN again stands for binary files. 
binaries like PWD, binary like LS will usually be found here. And since it finds it out for us, okay, since the exit finds it out for us, goes to these directories and finds it out for us, that is the exec VP, right? That is the P in the exec VP. P just stands for it uses the path variable in Linux, uses a path variable which has these contents to find out the executable's names. Okay? To find out if the executable is really present on the machine. And this V just stands for you provide the arguments to this particular exec using like an array of uh, like null terminated strings. Okay, array of null terminated strings, and so which just basically means that this v here stands for a vector. That array is also called as a vector, right? Vector of null terminated strings. So <laughs> that's how. Uh, that's the really, uh, meaning behind like uh, what V and P stands for. And similarly, you have if you just do a man exec. So this man shows some different exec. Okay, so if you want to find out the exec that we are searching for, maybe you should do a man of the man page itself. Okay. And then you have like see the user commands are one, system calls are two. But if you really don't want to, like the exit that we are trying to see is like system call, right? So it should be man to exec. Are like usually, even though like a system call, that will be like a wrapper written on top of these things in the C library. Okay, so that will be a wrapper written on top of these things in the C library. So here it is considered as a C library function, but in turn, actually, it's a system call. In turn, the C library will call the actual system call basically. Okay, so but if you really don't know which one you're searching for, the best option is man hyphen a for all. Except it shows this, then if you press Q, it goes to the next thing. It shows all the different except, and you can figure out if this is what I'm searching for. Then you can easily find it. So if you put a line of code after XFDP, would that ever run, or is that good? That's a very good question. Can you guess? Yes, it gets ignored. It will be ignored. That's a very good question. So what will happen? We really did not even talk about what is the return code or return value of except, right? Was exactly the question, or like what will happen if you have like a line of statement, like some C code here at line 26? What is going to happen? It is just going to be ignored because except again, it is one more interesting thing about except is it does not even return. Fork return returns twice, except does not even return if it is successful. If it is successful, if it is not successful, then it returns some, I think, minus one or something like that. You can check the man pages for that, and it just executes the next one. So the stack and the heap are not replaced? So the stack and the heap, that's a very good question. We just told like the code and the uh, static data are replaced in the child process, right? What happens to the stack and the heap? They will be, they will not be replaced by anything because stack and heap gets formed only when the child process starts running, let's say PWD or LS starts running, they are going to be formed, but the previous stack and the heap will be reinitialized. It's just like clearing out the contents there. So they get cleared out? They just get cleared out, like reinitialized. Basically you get like a new stack and a heap for PWD or for the child process. So Very good question. So yeah. num would not, the num itself would not be there. So the num that we had, okay, will not even be there in the child process because now you get a whole new heap altogether, a whole new stack altogether. It was there in the stack, it just got wiped off completely. Because now the stack is going to start from the beginning for the child process, like, because we just fixed it. Does that mean that any valid memory is deallocated when it clears up the heap? So yeah, so if we had like some memory, the child process had already created some memory, okay, in the heap, and all those memories just go. But we don't need to deallocate, right? Because the system doesn't work. 
Yeah, we really don't need to re-allocate, uh, yeah, free those memory because like it is like the operating system takes care of that, takes care of freeing those things. And one more thing is that even for small, the, the usually small programs that we are writing, we really don't need to like worry about freeing the memory that whatever we unlock because once your program gets finished, it is the operating system is going to immediately wipe off the entire memory that it allocated for your program. Okay, but we are like very specific about like clearing, freeing the memory because if we are writing some long running process like a server, like a web server, which may be continuously running and in that case for each day if you are like wasting like let's say uh, 512 MB or like 1 GB of memory by not allocating it then after some time, after like maybe 2 years or something like this, suddenly it's going to crash and then we would be the ones who would be like caught for that. You see? Yeah? And only the memory freeing only matters for long running programs. Because for short running programs, even if you allocate a huge amount of memory in the heap and if you forget to deallocate it, the operating system, once your program has finished execution, is just going to wipe off the entire memory that it had for core, data, stack and heap. So it's going to just retain the entire memory. So if you were to pass a pointer into this exact thing, like you're, you're running executing another program and you pass a pointer to something that you had allocated memory for, it would then point to nothing after that because the OS would wipe it out. So I, I'm first not even sure like if we can like pass pointers here because here that's the string. Yeah, it needs right. to be string. Right. So it, it just the format is you're going to create a new program altogether. Give me the name of the program and the arguments that the program takes. That's it. And then it is it all depends on how that program is coded. So basically at some point it runs with the program and like this batch is that where it's done. Yeah, exactly. So like at a high level, this is what is happening. So we saw this right. Uh, the code initially is called copying very similarly, and then the data also got stacking data basically. Got copied and then the heap and the stack. Now when you just call it exec, with let's say ls or something, maybe this code what we return with ls and this static data also what we return with ls and this stack will keep what like the initialization or something like this just got cleared off and reinitialization and this is now your new ls program and this exactly is what happens uh, behind the scenes when we are typing some command and pressing an enter try to process the shell we have the so parent is the shell you create the child and then the child completes execution then the parent returns parent so exec isn't responsible for reserving any PID or processing. No. So exec is not responsible for reserving any process IDs. The process ID reservation happens when? Fork. Whenever we just did fork. Immediately when you did fork, even though the two processes are similar, there are some differences. One of the major difference is the PID. It has a different PID altogether. So if if you replace the top port with an exec to sh, then it would just keep printing the same parent process. Can you do that again? If on line 9, if you add exec instead of port, and exec sh, would it just keep repeating the parent process ID? Here, you mean? Yeah, can, can you replace a process with itself? No, that's a very good question. So can someone answer that? So after four, okay, can we just replace the process that we're executing to to be the same process itself? Yeah, it will start over. It will just take the same executable, replace your things, and it will start from main basically. It will not do as we did in four, but it will do like as we did in PWD or LS. Very good questions. Yeah, because like again and again it's going to fork again. And just think about this. Yeah, that, that happens. Yeah, it will just keep on forking it. And in XP6, after a few seconds, it's going to crash. <laughs> because like you can't create more than 64 processes, okay? And in, in Linux, it really finds out. Like it has like a memory quota for each process, okay? And if you are creating a child, it also adds that thing to your quota, like together. It has some quota together for all the child that you're creating. If you're doing something like this, it's called a fork bomb. 
Okay, it's called four to bomb, and once it figures out that you're trying to do something, it immediately kills the parent process and all the the tail processes. And so, it, you can think of it like this. So, what happens when you have like you have a fork here? What will happen if we type another fork here? How many processes exist in the system at, the, uh, at line 12? Exactly. So it's going to be after line 10, we have a parent and a child. Okay? And they both are going to execute from line 11. And both are going forking. And so like it's going to be like uh, 2 here, 2 here. So at, at line 12, we are going to have like 4 new processes, so or four processes in total. So in the next key, like, the entire, like, whatever, today we said line 12, basically? Yeah, exactly. Those two things will start line 13, yeah, or line 12, yeah, yeah, line 12, sorry, line 12, which has line 12. So it, the scenario would be just like this. So you have a parent, okay, you just called four, created a child, now when you called four, this creates one more child, C1, and this creates one more child, C2. This would be the scenario. At the end, you would have like four processes running at the same time. Just think if you just did that in a loop of 100. That's it. That's a four four. Just call it four in a loop of 10 or 100 times, it's a four four. I think, and yeah, I think this is all you guys need to know about uh, four, exec, and wait. These are the process APIs.